good evening everyone welcome to the school of environment and architecture um uh, just to kind of uh, reintroduce uh, the c city uh, for everyone c city is an initiative of the school of environment and architecture uh, to create a cultural uh, plat- to create a platform for cultural discourse uh, we have been this is the fifth year actually of our uh, uh, c city series a uh, c city conversation series uh, and we have invited uh, over 80 uh, cultural practitioners from the city and uh, abroad uh, nationally as well as internationally uh, and uh, uh, the idea is to kind of uh, cross pollinate different ideas in the academic uh, kind of environment as well as with the uh, neighborhood and the community around us so uh, i'm uh, very happy that uh, i see so many new faces still uh, visiting c uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, today we have uh, with us prajakta potnis uh, who is an artist who has been practicing since 2001 uh, and uh, she is uh, uh, she is an artist who uh, works in a variety of different kinds of uh, mediums um, uh, uh, her practice sales through uh, painting site specific installations uh, sculptural installations um, uh, to public art interventions and uh, the fascinating thing about her practice is uh, as you must have also noted on our uh, poster today that she works out of a very small space in the city and it will be very interesting for us to look at how art um uh, uh, kind of can be produced um uh, uh through uh, even limited resources or in a place where uh, which has such a uh, frugal kind of uh, straight infrastructure or support uh and just uh, there's a very long list of uh, uh, um, engagements that prajakta has uh, uh, been a part of and uh, if i kind of uh, I, i would encourage all of you to actually kind of look into um uh, the variety of things that she has done but just to kind of count a few she was uh, uh, she she has been a part of uh, so many uh, art exhibitions uh, nationally as well as internationally amongst which are um, uh, uh, the recent iconic exhibition india revolted 70 years of investigating a nation which just happened last year which is curated by arshia lokhandwala um, and she uh, she participated in the 11th guanju biennale curated by maria lan lind uh, in 2014 she was a part of the kochi muzaris binale uh, curated by jitesh kallat um, and uh, there are so many uh, kind of uh, exhibitions that uh, uh, one could uh, keep listing but uh, i would like uh, praja uh, prajakta to herself kind of talk about her practice and her engagements uh, and i invite her on stage welcome prajakta hi uh, good evening everyone now uh, it's absolutely a pleasure to be here um, in morogli um so i just thought that uh, one when uh, rupali mentioned that you know i could come and probably share my work um i was wondering what could be of probably uh, what could be an entry point for everyone in a way to kind of relate to my practice um I thought that uh, yeah thanks so um I was just wondering uh, what uh, could be a kind of a general thread or an area that I could uh, probably share with you guys and I think the thing that kind of kept coming back to me and I think uh, something that I kind of struggle on an everyday basis is 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 the space issue is having a studio as an artist having a studio practice where um, you know you kind of um, work and uh, i mean just to give you a brief uh, insight into this um, i grew up in thani i grew up in a middle class family and um, just after jj i told my father that i think i need a studio space to rent uh, or something like that where i kind of you know go and work or you know have a space for myself to ideate maybe um my father was quite clear that uh, if i needed a studio then i should support it myself or else i could 
probably use one of the rooms in the house uh, in, in, in our 2 BHK and convert that into my studio space. Um, I was quite clear, luckily for me at that um, moment, that I wanted to walk to my workspace. I didn't want to kind of work from my house because I think... Um, I think that was also a reason because I thought that my, you know, I mean, as a woman, uh, it's very easy for you uh, to be taken for granted because you could be uh, painting and you could be thought of as someone who's just probably doing some kind of a hobby work in your house and your mom could just call you and say, thoda chai banalo because there's some, you know, guests who've come and you can go back and continue your painting. I mean, not much of a problem that way. Um, so I was quite sure in that sense that I wanted to walk to my workspace because I think it was not just um, a way of putting some kind of a discipline, discipline for myself but also for the people around me who had no clue what I was going to be doing, uh, how, because there's nobody in the family who was an artist so um, they kept thinking that probably, um, I mean the only idea of an artist that they knew of was the Rajesh Khanna who would sit in the house and probably paint Sharmila's eyes, you know, in, in that sense. That's the only uh, image of the artist that, or the Jholawal artist was, was the image that I think my family kind of was aware of. Um, I didn't know what it would take to be an artist, but I just knew this much that I had to walk to my workspace and I somehow managed to rent a small um, room inside, a, uh, inside an apartment. So there were other girls who were also renting out spaces and I could have this one room for myself in Thani, in this residential complex where I was paying 500 rupees um, at that time in 2000. And um, yeah, so, I, so that space, that was the first studio I had. Um, and the reason for why one needs a studio, I think kind of hopefully will get clear as one kind of moves or sails through the other parts of the work. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, one has always, I mean, I've always found it difficult to kind of, uh, again, as a woman artist, you know, when you have other, say, male artists making really large scale works in terms of these massive canvases or massive sculptural installations say with fibers and uh, object based um, you know uh, art how do you still kind of make your voice visible was was a constant question that kept coming or i was either asked by people or i also felt that necessity to kind of state it through my own work. Um, I think it will get cleared as we probably sail through the practice, but um, this was a work I did at my parents' apartment. Uh, this was in 1999. I was uh, in my third year, and I just uh, read about uh, the site-specific installations and earthworks and things like that. And I thought it was such an amazing uh, kind of uh, movement that happened in the Western art history where you almost had the freedom from say a gallery or a, um, you know you could you could almost um, work anywhere you could you could put an artwork anywhere and say that um, you did not need a gallery space to show your work you, you could make art anywhere um, so this is uh, done in my parents' uh, apartment and uh, these are bindis which are kind of stuck onto the walls and uh, I think it was also a rebellious attitude at that moment to kind of also uh, make them think of what contemporary art can be. It's not just the painting or, you know, the, the traditional kind of forms that they were expecting me to do because I would get, and I'm sure you guys would also, that, you know, whenever there's Diwali happening or, you know, there's, there's Rangoli, then you're, like, as an artist, made to kind of um, show your skills of, uh, you know, doing Rangoli. So I thought I wanted to kind of clearly make sure that nobody comes back to me asking if you can um, make these good Rangoli drawing. So this was in a way also um, kind of situated or done to kind of also tell them this is where I am and uh, this is what contemporary art is. 
um, for me they're just holes holes uh, kind of which um, uh, are just stuck on the walls um, of a uh, yeah of a middle class home oops yeah um so um i've been fascinated with walls and especially walls in middle class homes and um i was also at that time around 2005 2000 so i was thinking of ways of making work which could uh, easily be installed easily be uh, you know removed or destroyed in a way where i don't have to worry about um the um the kind of production value of a work um this was initially a drawing and i also kind of move i mean my practice kind of sails between various mediums and i don't find these separations uh, kind of quite strongly that way um so this was a drawing that i was sketching in my uh, notebook where i had kind of turned the wall into a curtain and um, i was invited for a residency um it was a coach residency in 2005 and um and going through the sketchbook i thought it would be nice to kind of physically make this work happen instead of just having it as an illusion on to a page um so i went to this local tailor who was there uh, in vasin then i managed to stitch this um this this oh god i'm really a uh, technology challenged and i don't see no no no, ah, no, no it's working yeah yeah okay that's the pointer and yeah. this is for the slide yeah so so the work actually is just this of course i mean this thing that you see is uh, kind of um stitched with a lo local normal cloth cotton cloth and kind of stuck on to the wall and the whole idea was to see if the wall can turn into a into a fragile curtain if it was possible to kind of make that happen the same work was later installed at this uh, place in warsaw it's called the national gallery of um installed the kenta uh, and uh, in warsaw and um, again i mean i was um, i i still hope that i can make works which are uh, kind of so disposable i would say that you know the work was just sent i was um, or I, i i went there i installed it and it was also thrown away later i mean i didn't have to worry about the cost and the uh, whole shipment issue of or or uh, you know transport issue in that sense and uh, it kind of inhabited itself well in this space and it also became more feminine somehow in this space with this really ornate uh, kind of um, structure that was already there i mean for me it almost became like a wedding gown this is a detail um this was 2008 and um, again i mean you know i mean one has moved from one studio to the other so from the studio in thani i moved to another studio in kanwevli after marriage and again the studio is a, a, a in in a residential complex it's a one bhk uh, which uh, you know you have these really uh, friendly neighbors around and things like that and um what i find and why i specify this one bhk is also because uh, it's interesting how work gets made into these really domesticated spaces and i think that somehow kind of filters within my practice um uh, it's um, i mean i've ever always wondered that what should be the issue that that one addresses you know you have so many um so many problems so many issues and how do you kind of address that through your practice uh but not making it um, kind of journalistic in a way uh, which is a problem i sometimes feel with work that just happens which is not uh coming somewhere from a personal inquiry i kind of feel that um I, i aspire for that at least that it it uh, it should have some kind of a personal inquiry it sh should be able to make that journey between the personal and the outside maybe 
um, this was a work that happened in 2008 and just playing around in the studio there were these old bulbs which were lying and I didn't know what to do with them and there were just these necklaces which were kind of there and I started sticking some uh, beads on them. Uh, it was also the time when I think I was also trying to imagine, I mean, I, I was personally facing some kind of issues on, uh, my, my mom had gone through um, uh, through an operation where she had a lot of these um, strange growth that was happening inside her uterus. And um, it kind of was quite a weird experience because I managed to almost see this uterus full of, um, you know, ping pong balls. I would, that's the image I had. Um, and I thought it was quite interesting that because from the outside, mom would look fine and everything looked fine, whereas inside there was something that was almost like a virus which had eaten up a portion of, of an organ. Um, so I kind of feel that the, these words, I mean, I wasn't uh, thinking of them as, as that, but I think uh, it was just, I think in a month's time, I realized I almost had um, about 200 small everyday objects which had just been infected with some kind of a viral growth and like, you know, things like this, it was just toothbrush with some... Um, I think it was also a time when, you know, it, you know, 2008, just before the uh, the markets crashed. I think, you know, India is shining, and you have the GDP going high, and you're also wondering where is it all going. I mean, you walk on the streets, you would still feel that you know things are quite bad and messed up. Uh, so I could kind of relate to this whole phenomenon of, of the virus, of, of the fibroid in a way, that everything looked fine on the outside, but probably totally uh, rotten on the inside. Um, I made those works. I, I made like about quite a few. I mean, what you see here are actually these small everyday random objects from Daijin bottles that you see there. Um, to bulb holders, to you know combs, being totally uh, infected with something. And uh, when I made them in the studio, I had no clue how I was going to install them because one had just made them. And uh, and and then I was invited to do a show, and I thought, okay, but then you know how do you install these really everyday mundane objects because they totally made sense only in my studio and uh, you know the other problem of this new white cube space how do you make sense of these objects which had a life of their own in my studio how do you make sense of them in a white cube space why would they make sense um, because of that question I think and through that question came these um, kitchen platforms, I think, in a way. These, these, these platforms, these kitchen platforms. And I thought maybe um, I would uh, kind of install these objects onto, onto these kitchen platforms and have them over like some kind of specimens which were probably found somewhere else and then they're just laid onto this table, these tables. Um, the easiest solution would be to just have the solo or the show in my studio, have people come over in the studio and, uh, you know, let them experience the works in my studio. Um, but I thought I'd take this up as a challenge. What is the white cube space and how does the work kind of uh, change when it um, comes into a white cube space? Um, what you see here are actually is, is a large photographic installation with these objects that you see on the tables um, in my studio space. So there's kind of an evidence of where they were or where they belong. And this is a close-up. So these kitchen, sorry. So these kitchen platforms were kind of granite platforms which were carved with um, you know references to a washing a wash basin and uh, kind of so so it became almost for me like a low relief sculpture so there was this one sculpture sculptures kept on to another sculpture 
the problem then happened that uh, these massive tables, these granite heavy tables had to be bought, got back to my one BHK, which became a super nuisance because I didn't have space to keep these tables. And when you're making work, you're not at that time really thinking about, and you're hopeful that everything sells. And um, for the longest time it didn't, and it came back to the studio and I would see them lying. And I kept telling myself, I can't be doing things like that where, um, they become burden, you know, and the work becomes a burden onto my shoulders where I have to worry about the production of it or also the space in which I kind of store them. Because this one VHK space has to convert into a thinking space, it has to convert into a, um, a drawing, a painting studio as well, and a storage space of works that are made and then they come back, and also of works which have the potential of becoming something. So this, this one space has to convert into all these, or accommodate all these things in a way. And that's how I actually came to photography. I thought, um, it was works that could just go on pen drives and I didn't have to worry about the, the, the space issue of it, the physical space issue of it. Um, that's how I think uh, I moved towards photography you know, on an absolutely practical level. Um, and uh, it was also a time when I think it was there's this news about the genetically modified vegetables that were going to be flooded into our markets. The cauliflowers were going to be flooded with, um, and they were going to be genetically modified, the aubergines, the, the tomatoes. And uh, so I kind of continued from those objects, those cultural objects. For me, it's absolutely the same thing, I mean, in that sense. But So this is shot inside a refrigerator. I think the idea of the refrigerator also was an absolute um, kind of a chance element. Um, I think because of the vegetables, I thought of the refrigerator. And uh, once I installed it, um, so, so this particular one uh, almost, uh, for me, is like a sculptural object. Um, so what I've done here is, you know, I've kind of almost uh, pinned these different smaller um, cauliflower portions and kind of, con you know, made this into a sculptural object. Also, um, what you see here is a bit of cotton, which is used to kind of hide those pins and things like that. Um, this actually is, is, is um, I didn't really think about it much. It was just there in my refrigerator. It was actually a plastic, cheap, uh, you know, the kind of mat, which was used by my mom. My mom had given it to me because, um, you know, we from our middle class families think we have to protect all our appliances and gadgets and things like that. So this actually is pretty useful. You can wash it. And so... Um, yeah, this was, so this was just there and then uh, I placed this uh, cauliflower and I really had no clue what I was really kind of come, you know, um, going to um, kind of discover. I discovered it only when I viewed it from the viewing um, point of the camera, when I was behind the camera and I looked at this image through the viewfinder, I realized how cinematic it was. Um, and that was a moment of almost uh, uh, realization of something that, you know, I mean, of, of, of something that's also why photography in a way. It, uh, and um, I mean, these, these objects which were really, which I kind of struggled with in a way, um, onto the tables, I thought I struggled with them, I had got their own life here. So I went on the journey of kind of photographing the aubergines, the tomatoes, um, and here the language remains the same as the objects for me. I've stuck these glass beads onto these aubergines, uh, quite similar to the beads that I was kind of sticking in the onto the objects.
I've just placed the image upside down here. It is just the tomatoes. The cauliflower. I mean, it was, um, yeah, I think, I think the discovery happened only when one was viewing it through the lens that it had, uh, one could play with scale. Um, you didn't know what, what place was this, what site was this. And um, it was almost a discovery into a new landscape of, of sorts. Move to this other site specific work where um, I was, uh, this, this was a work that happened um, and uh, in Clark House uh, in Bombay, and uh, I was invited for a show by Tushar Zok, uh, which was called The Right to Descent. Um, and I kept wondering why has Tushar called me because I mean my works are not political in that sense, and you know how am I going to kind of react to this, um, this this really strong political show. Um, I decided to just walk into Clark House, see the space, and that's what Tushar also urged me to do. And just said that, come to the site, just look at it. And so I walk into uh, Clark House. This is the this was their first show. And uh, on the top floor, there's this green carpet uh, which was there. And uh, as I walked in, this this place was completely closed for most of its time, and um, there was so much of humidity there. And you know, you walked in and you could feel the heaviness of air. And then I saw this green carpet, and I almost thought it was not a carpet but a moss which had kind of grown onto the floor. And uh, and I thought maybe I could do something. I could make a work which was not really about uh, it being uh, sculptural or site specific, but but something that could actually make you feel um, that you're breathing heavy. You know, you walk into this space, and if if a work can manage to do that, if you walk into a space, and is it possible for an individual to feel the heaviness of air and and breathe heavy? Um, so for me, these these extensions that I did on the walls are just um, are not really the work. I think for me, the work is when you really walk in. Um, and what I did was I placed um, the Armed Forces Act, the Special Armed Forces Act. Uh, you know, I took a printout of it and I placed it on top of this table, which was already there. And um, so, so referred to that in a way as as something that was like a stagnant law, which is um, uh, yeah left in in this really heavy room. So I come back to the studio again, and then you know you you're trying to kind of play around and work around with things and objects around that that are kind of available to you. Um, I think sometimes works just happen through intuition in a way. You know, you have an image and you know you want to do it, and then you just are trying to make sense of it. Um, so for this particular work, uh, which happened in 2009 actually, and I really wanted, uh, there was this urge that if I could stitch a wall, is it possible to actually take a, you know, a, a needle and stitch a wall? Is it possible to do that? Um, and obviously, I mean, practically not possible, but then I tried to kind of make or create devices of making it look like it's 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 stitched in a way. Um, so these are threads actually, which are kind of stuck on the wall, and uh, they kind of they, as you walk into the space, you feel like um, the, the the space is kind of cracking up and you know breaking apart. Um, this this work was also shown at the Gwangju Biennial and. Um, so this is like you know this lob I mean this long corridor that you kind of navigate to go from the first floor to the floors above, and I kind of worked on it. Um, but I mean, 
for me, this this particular work, I mean, when I was kind of trying to work with it, I didn't even imagine the scale at which it could grow, uh, because one was also looking at it almost like a line drawing, a drawing that's physically there on the wall um, in a space. This is how it looked, with some threads kind of just... They're not good installation shots because the problem with some of the site-specific installations is also such that you have to really experience the space in a way and uh, feel it. Uh, this was shown at the Wolfsburg Museum again recently, last year, and this was a 16-meter wall again. Um, I kind of, I mean, when I look back for myself, I think I, I enjoy the kind of distance the work has traveled from it being really a tiny kind of experiment on the studio wall to this really insane uh, size and, uh, and scale. So for me, it has various connotations of the wall being a membrane um, of of these of, of drawing literally like a line drawing onto onto the site onto the space to um, the you know these 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 cracks almost looking like. Um, like probably lands of contested or borders of contested lands and so in this particular one I've kind of weaved sorry um, kind of weaved some borders of between say Sierra and uh, things like that but they're hidden so it's not necessarily people should know about it there's just some kind of coded uh, language for my own self. Again, this obsession with walls and um, so here what I did was it started off on a very simple kind of uh, nostalgic uh, thing that one would do as a kid, you know, you had these cervical, um, you know, things that you would stick on, I mean, apply on your skin and then see how, you know, uh, if you're peeling the cervical, it felt like you're peeling your own skin. Um, so here what I've done is just used cervical onto the painted walls and kind of made them feel like the colors peeling out of the walls. So I go back to the photographic works once in a while again, and I think um, I think I almost felt like I'd not discovered the space of the refrigerator, the inside of the refrigerator, and I thought it needed some more inquiry. Um, it, it had so much of resonance to something like an airport. The inside of the refrigerator almost reminded me of these really antiseptic spaces in that sense. Um, so I made these uh, miniature escalators and I kind of uh, placed them inside the refrigerator and then took pictures of them. And this one. So there's not much Photoshop except the filter. There's, there's a blue filter here. And that's about it. And the same kind of setting. It's a wide angle shot. That's it. But I think it, it I mean, again, I mean, once you kind of shoot these images and look at it and the scale of it and things like that, it, it has a very cinematic, um, surreal, um, you know, sci-fi kind of feeling to it. And I thought that they work better as, um, as uh, you know, light boxes than, than prints on paper. So this is how they were. They were displayed like this at the Bhauda Jilad Museum last year. So actually, I mean, yeah, I mean, one doesn't, uh, it, it would be a problem if these works have to come back to the studio, there wouldn't be no space. And uh, since they're kind of industrially printed and, you know, done, you can't think of 
kind of letting go of them as well worse come to worse but at least there's no uh, preciousness that's attached to the kind of uh, production value of it yeah this is how they were displayed This was a work uh, again. I mean, speaking of distances and spaces, in that sense, this was a work that happened uh, when I was asked to do a show in two cities at the same time, um, and I somehow wanted to kind of connect these two cities, and I was wondering how could one do that. Um, I managed to ask a friend who was willing to con you know collaborate and contribute. Um, so what we did was we uh, this was Bombay and Calcutta. There was this uh, show that was happening, and so I asked a friend to shoot the sky from Calcutta while I was shooting it from Bombay at the same time. And we took uh, we started from sunrise in Calcutta to sunset in Bombay. Um, it's interesting because there's also uh, almost one hour time difference between Calcutta and Bombay, which we do not follow. We follow the Indian standard time. So it's interesting to almost, uh, like the crack, know that you know there is, there is a, a gap that exists, but it's almost covered in, in that sense, that there is, there is a lapse in time, but it's never kind of looked into. Um, so these are just two um, rows of the, the upper uh, row that you see is um, is the sky from Calcutta and the row below is the sky from Bombay. And uh, what's labeled are just the time, um, uh, is just the time. So from 5.27 a.m. to 6.48 p.m. we were kind of photographing this. So um, I was kind of invited for a residency in uh, in the Kadistat Foundation, which is in Paris, uh, for two months. Um, again, a question that usually comes to an artist that you know, okay, you've you've kind of invited for a residency, and this was not something that I'd applied for. So, how do you make sense of your work in this new space, in this new situation? How do you kind of uh, make sense of it. So I went through a lot of research and I was trying to figure out ways of kind of um, entering the, the city through my work. Um, so what happened here was um, I'm, I was quite clear that I wanted to uh, look at the city through somebody else's window. I wanted to see it from a Tunisian man's window, how Paris would look. I think this also came because around that time there was a whole lot of conversations happening about integration, about uh, people coming from the outside, you know, with Shiv Sena and uh, Manasena saying things like, uh, okay, you can come to Bombay, but then you don't uh, come here with your culture. Um, so it's kind of with these thoughts, I had almost uh, kind of, you know, reached Paris with thoughts of what it is to not carry your culture. Is it even possible? So this particular work is, is where I've shot windows from a Tunisian man's house. The ceiling is from um, a Sri Lankan man's house and the door is from somebody who's, I think, Syrian who's living on the outskirts of Paris. And it's called Room Full of Rooms and it's just these different parts that kind of come together and make this one house. Um, there are two layers to this work. So along with the projections, there's also uh, the Paris lace, uh, the Parisian lace I found in these old markets, which I kind of stitched with uh, some lace which I carried from Bombay. So just to add like two layers to the work also, uh, in a way to make it look like there were peeled colored walls, which, um, you know, the sense of almost apathy towards the situations. So, um, these, this particular work, I mean, again, happened in, in another place, in Shanghai, where I was invited for a show where um, uh, there was just these... Um, 
you know the uh, old hundred year old house which was kind of bulldozed over for a new city to come or new kind of I think industrial place to come and so I managed to recover these old uh, walls uh, pieces of walls and I kind of worked on each one of them um, for me the, here the wall almost becomes like a witness to history you know something that has witnessed um, what has happened so these almost elements become like evidences in a way which are kind of layered with paper so what you see here are, are, are just um, colored paper that I have painted and I have stuck onto these uh, pieces of walls I've worked on the shadows and things like that So this was a work that happened in Berlin and uh, again, I mean, you know, I, I mean the work happened only because of this one washing machine that was there in our residency space. Uh, it was a German washing machine and uh, I was uh, totally disoriented looking at this machine because uh, all the instructions were given in English and one had no clue how to use this. The one knows how to use a machine, but you know, they felt totally disoriented looking at this machine. And I was quite sure, and, and as I, I realized after a while that I was spending like almost two or three, you know, I mean, you know, a crazy amount of time just looking inside the cavity of this appliance. And it kind of made me think about what was it with me and looking at these appliances, you know, the insides of these appliances. Um, I think they're very cathartic. There's a cathartic experience of just looking at clothes wash, you know, go through the cycle of um, of being washed and cleaned in a way. Um, and uh, so I think the work, I mean, it's called The Kitchen Debate and there's a whole lot of narrative with it in which I don't want to dig into, but I think I'll just speak about the everydayness of the work and the toxicness that I kind of wanted to um, kind of uh, touch upon. So this is like one element of the work. The title is Circulation, Digestion and Toxicity. And... Um, yeah, there's just these drawings on. So I call these toxic drawings. So I've done drawings on the wall and I've layered them with um, the foam sheet. So this is just to give a glimpse of, there were 81 slides which were shot. So it's almost like an animation, like a stop motion animation of a movement. Um, so I took like 81 images of this one cycle of Oops. Yeah. Um, of these clothes just weightlessly moving into this, um, yeah, into this this cavity of this appliance. And for me, it had various. I mean, as one kept looking at this whole cycle, there, there are various layers of um, of how it could also had. You know, visually it looked almost it could be a part of a spaceship or, you know, a submarine of sorts. This particular one, which was also shown with this uh, washing machine image, is actually, uh, there are about 81 images of the blender trying to blend a cauliflower. And it was about toxicity and digestion in our everyday life. So there's just these images of the cauliflower and you kind of zoom in and zoom out till you reach the last, uh, this was one of the toxic drawings with it. So yeah, this is the sequence, but there are about 81 kind of images with it. So you, the first image that you see is like these solid uh, cauliflower uh, pieces, which kind of, so it's also a bit humorous in a way of also imagining that this can have the potential of becoming an artwork. Um, yeah, I'd rush through this and this. Yeah, I can go back to the refrigerator once in a while and kind of, um, 
you know, situate new narratives in it. I think this particular work happened also when I was reading, I'd come back from Berlin, I was reading about this whole thing of how um, uh, in Norway they were building the seed vault and I almost thought that was it some kind of a sign that the world is ending and uh, made this whole series of work. So that's actually your copper bend pipe that you get in your hardware stores and these are actually your blender, uh, you know, the blender blades. Um, also it's interesting way I find most of these, this material, um, you know, on the station road and, you know, as you walk from the station road, you usually find all these shops with, have almost like some kind of an urban debris, you know, in a way where um, there's so much of these, these everyday kind of residues, which are just left. Um, it's a foam sheet used for packaging, which again converts into... Yeah, again, found on the station road in Goregao. But I think there's a sense of almost um, some kind of... I mean, if you keep looking at it, I hope it should have that kind of sense of a loud sound without really uh, having the sound in it. This is how it was displayed and yeah, so I come to the most recent one, which is the last two images which I'd like you guys to so this is the most recent work which was shown at the Sharjah Foundation recently and uh, so just keep this image in mind and I'll show you a video and then we can speak a bit about this. plays in loop obviously I don't know how many of you really noticed um, but uh, so so that's the video I just managed to capture on my phone and uh, this is actually the uh, the menu card that these two guys that you see in the video actually so it's a takeaway menu card that these two crows were really at it and they managed to make these bird forms in them and I thought it was a beautiful way to look at the process of art making in a way of collaboration of of also the moment of finding something at that moment of being present and um, as an artist I feel it was almost a moment of chance where um, you're present in a moment and you're hoping that that moment almost speaks for itself and uh, you're just a mediator in the end so um, it's a funny one but it is absolutely beautiful I mean for me I think that uh, one was present at that moment and so so the way they were displayed are actually they were displayed as um, as hot plates so uh, yeah this is how they were displayed um, they're like these glass tops which have these knobs that you can turn on and off and you see these videos and um, this is one of the hot plate number two or something like that but I'd leave you with this last video and then we can spend time chatting.
so this goes on in in a loop but uh, yeah i mean i'd end it with these two eyes of fire or rings of fire or um, looking back at you in a way and uh, yeah and kind of end it at that yeah thank you so questions yeah. and <laughs> sure that after looking at all your works people are giggling in their minds yeah but at the same time thinking about what they are thinking sure sure no no of course there's no pressure but uh, it'd be nice to have some kind of response so i've tried to kind of i mean the brief that i kind of mentioned i hope it kind of gets cleared into the way the works have happened but um, but you feel free to ask questions i can go on i can go on on about how we inhabit our studios and how we kind of make works within them i was just telling upali how um, the the most recent studio that i've got in goregaon which is a rented place and it's really a headache because you um, are kind of you know your immediate neighbors absolutely suspicious of you know what what are you doing in that sense because they're they're wondering there's no family there's no uh, you know they're not like proper um, say chairs and you know uh, sofas that you know a normal household would have there no god pictures i was asked about that that um, okay you've moved in where are your god pictures and i was really uh, shaken i thought how could this person really just like i don't even know him and never seen him is only old and i am giving him that respect but he's really walked into my personal private space and asked me a question about my um, you know my religious beliefs and uh, we had and i said no i don't believe when you know i don't have any god pictures and and he was so annoyed and since then for almost one one and a half year we had these cold wars that was happening between us and then i realized well you know i can't have that i can't continue if you're going to inhabit that immediate next door you better make peace with this whole situation so i figured out a way i say hello to him every time i see him and we've kind of eased the Uh, tension a bit and he's okay with me i think i hope but yeah so uh, so it's interesting how as artists we kind of work within these um, i mean even even this space and that's what i told rupali it's amazing that you know to have this kind of an uh, architecture college within the suburbs of bombay in in borovli where you have you know you hear the pressure cooker whistle and then you're speaking of architecture actually in that sense so i think it's quite beautiful how we uh, maneuver and uh, inhabit these spaces yeah. thank you so much prajakta i i have seen your work but i think this is the first time i've seen it in this kind of journey yeah, you know so it's really beautiful to see it like that um and i i mean you you kind of in your in the presentation you spoke about the fact that uh you know your work is not political yeah. and then you know you, you showed us the clark house work where yeah. you know, were struggling with yeah. what, you know kind of yeah. working with this idea of the political yeah. but for me it seems like more than the clark house work the yeah. rest of the work you know <laughs> is much more political yeah. Yeah. in that sense you know in some ways you kind of there is this the idea of the domestic space yeah. and the domestic space suddenly becomes threatening yeah. you know and i think that's kind of a yeah. recurring thing yeah. that's happening and yeah. is in very in interesting the way you began with this whole struggle of your studio and the really kind of the expectations of yeah. being that artist and then kind of turning around to make that domestic space threatening yeah. all the time yeah. so i think that's i mean i don't know if you want to speak a little bit yeah. about that oh. but also i think just a second thing that you know often you know, we, we see biennales after biennales yeah. and there's this kind of biennale effect yeah. you know suddenly like yeah. there is this urge to blow up the scale of yeah. things totally. and you know fill up spaces these humongous spaces Completely. that you get but in you know, your work it seems like this very interesting shift from the studio yeah. to the the space of, yeah. of you know the gallery yeah. or wherever yeah. you work but it didn't seem like it was colonizing yeah. it was still threatening the okay. studio yeah. but in some ways you kind of managed to tame that scale yeah. or you know a little bit so yeah. i don't know if you want to speak about sure. these two things yeah no feel lovely 
No, I mean, of course, uh, one, uh, I mean, I, I don't know, I always, uh, I think I was responding to the fact that also we grew up around that time when we were constantly questioned, okay, what is the issue you're working on? And also I think the contemporaries were working with issues which were extremely either nationalistic in, in a way or, or colonial, you know, kind of questioning that kind of thing. And uh, it's, I, I don't know, initially I really didn't know how to define this, but I was just quite sure that I wanted the work to have um, it filtered through my personal experiences. I have to be the first witness in some way or the other um, to be able to put that kind of, um, I think, an emotional layer into the work, which I think I almost started feeling was missing with works which were uh, speaking about, say, the war, or, I mean, if I'm speaking about war or terror, can it be still um, spoken from your immediate, uh, you know, space or, or uh, a situation like even the refrigerator. Um, so it took a while to kind of also find that and be comfortable with this uh, because uh, one, uh, I mean, I, don't know, I always kept thinking that uh, you, you know, you can easily be labeled into an autobiographical thing. How do you still not make it autobiographical but have, uh, have the edge where anybody can enter and it makes sense um, on, on a larger level uh, so yeah there were just these I mean I think now I'm okay I'm, I'm kind of okay with where where it has gone and you can look back but when you're making that one particular work you are just not sure where it's going to land um, probably um, and yeah I mean also there's just this resistance I mean you constantly in the end want to hear your own voice uh, with the way the biennials have also or even the market the way it has uh, kind of affected the works of artists suddenly you have artists speaking about say um, I mean it was not just them but it was also the, the pressures around them you had to pay bills you have to pay bills and uh, you had the galleries uh, asking for say larger uh, scaled uh, works so how do you kind of have a balance with uh, something like that and I also so I don't want to be really judgmental about the way they, some other artists have probably gone with their own practice but I kind of also feel that uh, uh, for, for people probably I mean I, I was quite sure that I didn't want the works to just be large scale or just be um, like I remember for the 2000 those, those bulb works I was constantly asked that what is the life of this object and I really didn't know I mean I've also stuck uh, mustard seeds on some of them and uh, I didn't know the life of what it would be to uh, you know stick mustard seeds and apply melamine to it and I didn't know how long it's going to last but it lasts I mean at least it lasted for 10 years uh, within my studio um, so because of that I didn't want to make works which were just in fiber or in say copper things which could you know you know so, so there's a like one kind of resisted that constantly uh, but because of that then you also are struggling to pay your studio bills <laughs> you know in a way uh, but then you find ways you kind of find ways uh, through say grants sometimes through friendships uh, I think um, if, if one has to shoot something you would ask a friend to edit or things like that so there are ways of uh, navigating that meagerly uh, space as well um, yeah <laughs> Uh, I'm a third year, right? Yeah. And uh, I really liked your presentation and the, the way you showed and put uh, your work and narrated the whole thing. And I also really liked your work. So uh, it's not a question, but just a thing I was wondering and, and I would like to share. Um, I'm not sure, and I, I might be wrong. It might, might not be the intent, but I felt that many of your work was about manipulating uh, every day to show the viewer and, the, and experience the viewer the, about every day, the scale of it, uh, juxtaposing things, also a manipulating person's experience with the help of, again, everyday objects, the threads, curtain, moss on the walls, kitchen objects. Uh, what I'm really wondering is uh, the nature of art now, but, uh, because somewhere it kind of takes apart from everyday and becomes a different entity. 
uh, I mean, art throughout history mostly has been differentiated itself from everyday life. Uh, also, the way we think about it, we difference it from the life, the mundane life, we difference it. Uh, I mean, for art to speak, it has to lift up and kind of lift up from the mundaneness. And I feel somewhere it become it kind of becomes an imitation game. It portrays the everyday life, but it is not yet every day. And because the materiality changes, the medium changes, the motive of its existence changes. And, and there is constant attempt of creating art. Uh, and, uh, but, but, and which draws this separation from every day. Mm -hmm. You want to... <laughs> That's a beautiful answer. I mean, question and answer probably in itself, but you want to kind of expand a little more on it? or uh, Because I haven't got that real uh, grip over your question. I, you, I think you asked that how this thing from the everyday allows us to actually live everyday. No, I, if I'm not wrong, um, what he's trying to say is that at what point does the object uh, suspends to be, uh, from being everyday mm -hmm. object mm -hmm. to a work of art? Okay. Uh, okay. And, and at that, in that jump, does, yeah. does it cease to remain a, in a okay. part of the everyday? Yeah. And it goes it's a beautiful to question. It's loaded with because it's uh, within the Western art history only. You know, the answers are there. So when your urinal becomes a fountain and it uh, is placed on that pedestal, it becomes the uh, um, art object. Um, well, I'm, I mean, I really, like, it is a pointed question because I think I do feel that I take on things that are totally non-art in that sense. Like, you are looking at a washing machine and you are telling yourself, can this have the potential of, I don't know about art and, and then what is art, it becomes like another larger question, but has the potential of transforming into being something else? Does it have the potency of being uh, or taking on and becoming something else? Um, I think there are, you know, every art form or everything would have a grammar of its own. So when I am, what I'm doing probably, when this whole motion, this fast cycle of washing clothes, when I am kind of uh, making it that motion into a stop motion kind of a film, when I'm just cutting and slicing each image and we're looking at that each image in that circular kind of portion, you're hoping that it is able to do what, what it did to you when you, um, it, you're hoping that it can do that to the viewer when you, when that it did to yourself when you were looking at it, that it did make me take into a cathartic space. It did make me think of this whole cycle of the everyday, of the churn in a way. Is it possible? I mean, it, it might work for a viewer, it might work for someone else, it might not work for somebody else. It's, it's also playing on that edge in that sense and that's also happened with works like the curtain in a way that people have just walked past it. Hey, nahi, abhi pata hai ki banaya hai, kuch art hai usme. Um, so, I don't get bothered that it is viewed like that or not, but I just hope that it have if it can have the potency of of making someone think about it, making someone think of that moment of the everyday at least. Um, I think the, its departure happens through the grammar of it. So, what it now is not most it's not stressful, you know, like you. The easiest one is you put something on a pedestal, it can become that. But we are hoping that when you are putting a curtain onto the skirting of the wall, that it becomes surreal enough and that surrealness just doesn't remain as an image but as an experience as you walk, probably. That's probably where the departure should happen. Um, yeah, I don't know. I hope I've answered the question, but it's in you know, but yeah, I mean, it's an interesting uh, kind of observation. Yeah, thanks.
Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Much better. Uh, so I have two questions which kind of build on Rupali's and the other questions. Yeah. Uh, one was, you know, what is the relationship for you at this point between the studio space and the exhibition space? Mm-hmm. What's uh, my relationship uh, between the studio and for you? What is the relationship between the studio space and the exhibition space? Yeah. Or the white cube, as you put it, and for you know, for art to become art, does it have to travel? from one space to the other uh, and not necessarily traveling back in some ways or does it travel back in some yeah. ways uh, and so that, that you know uh, a lot of it is about this line between what is art and non-art and mm-hmm. kind of playing with that so I was just wondering uh, what how you think of that relationship yeah, yeah. well I mean in, in today's time I think it's very easy for that journey to not just move from uh, the studio to the exhibition space I think it's it's far more interesting and it has also happened in history or it's quite possible to do that that you'd rather have your viewer come into this you know alternative spaces sites where the work has probably happened and uh, conceived and emerged uh, so I don't find that um, like challenging or different I think it has been part of art history it's been part of um, it is possible I think it should be more the the, uh, the requirement of the work of, of where it can uh, of course in a white cube space it becomes extremely it has multiple layers no it has the uh, layer of uh, but I think even in uh, even otherwise I think the 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 uh, the, the, uh, the value part becomes um, is it's even in in the white cube space it's as as valuable as it probably nowadays it can also be in your own studio it can, you know so. Um, yeah, so that journey I think is quite. Um, what was the other one that you asked? Just to, uh, no, it, it was kind of related. If art, you know, sometimes becomes art when it makes that journey from the studio space to mm. the white cube. Because in a house, it's just a cauliflower that when you know enters yeah. the white. For me, it changed in the viewfinder. That's what I said. For me, that moment of it becoming cinematic was almost the moment I viewed at that staged uh, installation through the viewfinder. It was not really going to the gallery. It didn't matter. Uh, it or even a, if the image was printed or not printed it was just that moment of realization that oh my god this is absolutely a magical image uh, which you can't uh, kind of uh, f- because your eyes are not flattening that image when you're looking when you're staging it you know when I was um, I mean just to give a practical kind of explanation when I was working on the cauliflower work or the aubergine it, it, it was like okay I mean I wasn't um, expecting that kind of a result. I think the whole scale and space changed the uh, dynamics of the work. Uh, so in the in the refrigerator series, it was absolutely um, the moment of realization that this is a very cinematic uh, moment. And I think works have now like uh, like. I, I mean, even the first uh, installation, and there were a few others which I have not shown here, were actually done in my uh, parents' uh, residential building. So, you know, this whole Rangoli business also, I have not shown that particular work, but um, every now and then, as soon as I joined JJ, I was told that, Achama, you know, now you should do, be able to do good Rangoli or good Mehendi. Another thing and I just to just stop those stories what I did was I drew uh, small lines from the ground floor till my third floor house and uh, so basically I just did that not to say this is also art but I just wanted to uh, have these kind of questions oh is this art also then what does it mean and is it contemporary art okay then it's not what is modern art basically just have the uh, residents of this one society called the Gautam Society in Thani in Panchpakadi to 
talk about it because nobody, I mean, they're quite curious. They do for them. The image of the artist is just this Hussein who, you know, walks without uh, shoes in a way, which is also, I mean, it helped us. I, I wouldn't, it was, because I think in college days, I would just say, ha, so what Hussein does, I do that kind of art in a way. So it was easier to explain to people because otherwise they're just, okay, then you should either do commercial arts, you know, I mean, what are you finally doing and this kind of site specific works where you know who's going to buy them and um, what's the meaning of it as well so I, I think one does try to kind of at least push in question so so uh, hello yeah, yeah. Hi. So, I was just noticing one thing that your work had like overlaps of uh, this you use the word as well the magic of things where uh, the magic of making yeah. and uh, finding and mm -hmm. pointing sort of overlap and you can see that transition mm -hmm. but at the same time uh, I mean a lot of it is intuitive or very sensory yeah. like you look at something and you're awed by it yeah. and you just want to share that moment yeah. sometimes and yeah. at the same time because it's an impulse uh, there's also this uh, also, as you were talking, you know, the Benali and how there's this urge to ground something into a reality which is yeah. surrounding us yeah. or to give it more weight mm -hmm. with, let's say, thematics like yeah. the war and yeah. colonial and yeah. all of that. So, uh, one, when, like, you've done the act and then you sort of reflect back on it. And we try to sort of ground it so that it's not just an impulse. Sometimes that is yeah. much. One, how do you tackle that? And second, when maybe the impulse is driven by realities, uh, how do you negotiate that sort yeah. of yeah. space? No, absolutely a poignant uh, question. And I think one tries to... I think I'm in a far more uh, calmer space now that I can say that uh, this is done intuitionally and I stand by my intuition and um, and there is magic to things that just happen through senses and through imaginations because probably these imaginations are just coming from say earlier kind of findings or experiences and things like that and today I don't feel the burden of uh, of labeling them into some kind of an, um, you know, uh, or contextualize them with some loaded meaning. Uh, I think it's also at a stage where I feel that one needs to stand with things like painting. I, I feel that, um, I feel the urge to just sit in the studio and paint and draw and, you know, things like that. So, and painting does happen quite intuitionally where you're just, uh, you know, looking at the blank canvas and probably trying to make sense of it. So, uh, but I think I just need to ground it somewhere for myself so that they, that they don't remain just as, um, and intuition isn't a, uh, it's, it's quite a, um, I think a brilliant moment where, you know, something comes and appears in front of you. I don't think uh, because of the conceptual uh, ness of something one should, uh, or, or because of the loaded meaning of something, one should reduce uh, in intuition to a level of just something that can, you know, I think those moments are very precious moments in a way. Um, and I do struggle even today when probably you have to, you have a context in place. Like I think I'd struggled with something like that during the Berlin show where I knew that I wanted to work with uh, the kitchen appliances, but I also wanted to work with the Cold War in a way. I knew that, but I didn't have a, um, a, uh, an image in front of me of how it was going to be staged. Um, so one does, I mean, I, I like to move around with both these directions within my practice uh, and I wouldn't want to reduce intuition or aesthetic or um, I think to conceptual art, I wouldn't. I, I totally stand up for painting and intuition and um, I think, yeah. Hello, can you yeah, hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for walking sure. us through uh, this thick and rich forest of ideas.
Um, so one thing that stood out for me was, of course, the fact that the everyday is a consistent thread that connects many of these works that you've shared with us. And one specific work, which was, if I'm not mistaken, this is a house, this was a home, or... There was, yeah, this was a home. Yeah, this yeah. was a home. Yeah, yeah. Where I think the everyday is juxtaposed with a spectacular event mm -hmm. of displacement or dispossession. Mm -hmm. So two questions here. One is, what is the picture of the everyday mm -hmm. that you are providing as an invitation to engage with? That you are providing. That you are providing as an invitation to engage with. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, when with the juxtaposition of this spectacular, what I would call an event, which mm -hmm. is an ordinary yeah. mundane thing, yeah. once in a while the displacement yeah. comes yeah. and strikes yeah. uh, in a particular place, then could you speak a bit about the process as to how did you how did you come to engage with this particular mm -hmm. uh, instance mm -hmm. of displacement, mm -hmm. but also then its relationship with the everyday, and mm -hmm. then what are we left with? Then what remains of the everyday? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So in in that particular work, I think uh, I think it has resonance to so many of the earlier works of. Um, I was imagining walls to kind of be almost witness to what was happening within a household. And from these household everyday objects, I just thought that the wall is, is plays the witness to something, to an event. Um, so these were already initial probably ideas and um, I think uh, issues that one was kind of dealing with. And, uh, and with the invitation of the show in Shanghai, one was trying to dig about, okay, you know, what are the possibilities of kind of entering that space? How do you kind of make that into your, uh, or put that into your own um, work um, kind of vocabulary? And uh, I was asking about new uh, possibilities or, or, you know, news that was around of probably buildings that were being erased and things like that and this just happened to be one of it it could have been anywhere it could have been even a Delhi house it could have been um, um, you know any any kind of it, it could I mean the place is not absolutely relevant in that sense uh, for me yes it, it became a bit difficult to imagine so what were the kind of witness I mean what kind of witnessing is what I'm trying to share onto these walls is is what I was trying to probably figure out so I went to the old markets I was trying to look at wallpapers and I tried to get those wallpapers and uh, kind of so in a way it is uh, the, the material the wall itself is very loaded with its own personal thing what I'm doing is just kind of um, actually just putting like just covering it up in a way. I'm not really revealing anything out of it. Um, I think they remain as just pieces that you're supposed to probably come and uh, feel that there's, there's also leftover pieces of probably, you know, flesh in a way where, you know, skin has been ripped apart or something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, with that particular work, I think it could have been, I mean, in, in terms of site, I think it could have been any any other site and place. Um, yeah. Hello. Um, so I'm a third year ex-student. Yeah. Um, so... It, the journey which you talked about, your whole lifestyle, being in a middle class family, and then your journey took play, take place, and how do you, how your art is then reflecting your everyday? Was there a point where you thought to engage with somebody else's everyday? Like, how does a life which have already taken place from a past, and then how? Does that uh, objectify them? Like, how does that artwork, somebody thinks of this object as my artwork of my life? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you are thinking of a tube light and then that whole, whole thing which was going around yourself and then engaging, like going beyond and going and engaging with somebody else who is there in your everyday or who is not there in your everyday, play, play some role. 
and then understanding how uh, that person takes that objectification into like artwork or mm. how do you understand I mean I'm hoping that? that they relate through their own experiences like if you see the blender uh, the you know the image of the refrigerator where there's just those blender blades which are left or even the pressure cooker I mean you're just supposed to probably enter from your own personal histories it's not really my uh, kind of entry point that I am placing I think it, it starts from a personal kind of uh, uh, initiation, but it is left for anyone else to enter. And one is hoping that you kind of, if you look at these burners that you see every day, that they become something else in that sense and, and not necessarily what it means to me. I mean, for me, they look like eyes which are watching back, but they could be anything else in that sense. And, and I'm hoping that it doesn't just situate itself in this one kind of narrative and dialogue and that it opens up to people to draw their own references from it. They can be nostalgic, it could be, um, you know, it could be even imaginations through a sci-fi comic or things like that, that you kind of enter to the work. Um, but again, I mean, I just remember what you asked and I'm trying to answer, think to myself what it is that uh, would be every day, if I'm trying to get it right, what would be every day you're trying to uh, leave for the viewer? Is that what it was in a way as a question, if I'm right? Sorry, can you hear the mic, please? There's no one every day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, it's exactly that, that how do we think through the everyday, not just as mundane and yeah. routine, yeah. but then for me what was interesting was in these two moments, one is uh, with the, the illness that your mom had, yeah. and in this displacement movement, yeah. where it's something out of the ordinary that strikes, Yeah. And then the way you reorient our gaze on the everyday shift. Yeah, yeah. Like the cauliflower moment is yeah. also this moment yeah. where yeah. scale, yeah. there's a play. Play, yeah. yeah. So it's about trying to understand this whole variation, this whole yeah. terrain of every day yeah. Yeah. that you're bringing to us. Yeah, yeah. That is where I Yeah, I mean, for me, they just become starting points. You know, you need a starting point to also just take off. And what can be that starting point? And usually it is something that's around you. Um, so, I mean, not necessarily the whole dialogue is just about the... Um, mundaneness in that sense and I think it's um, it's it's not made to look boring at all in that sense it's, it's absolutely taking off from just these points of which are absolutely familiar and common in that sense so yeah uh, hi I'm from Atoja. thanks um, <laughs> so uh, I was I had been to Bhavadaji Art Museum when the installation was up. Uh, I was there uh, at the la uh, museum when the mu uh, installation was up. So uh, I looked. I was uh, looked. Uh, we had this design. Uh, th um, this thing of the question of what is an archive, mm -hmm. and I was questioning what is how uh, how can we archive time. Mm -hmm. So uh, through that uh, the escalator in the refrigerator and the uh, text that you had written about the sterile uh, st sterileness of the refrigerator yeah. and the expansion of the time through yeah. the extending the decomposition yeah. so uh, I was uh, thinking that so and even la like now you mentioned that uh, people used to ask that uh, how much time would this work last mm. and uh, also they, there are these questions about uh, the dependency on of uh, the art piece on its context, mm -hmm. like you try to create that kitchen platform, or mm -hmm. but uh, you know that for you, no, sorry, for you it uh, draws back to the kitchen that you got it from. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe, malab, it, but the context of the art piece itself, you know, escalates it from uh, malab, the unusuality of 
the piece itself somewhat brings it so what would then your take on the context of the art form be being mm-hmm. that even the decomposition of that art piece is when time plays a role it does it does of course i mean it completely does and uh, i think uh, one is just taking that chance and one wants the work to kind of live its own life and uh, because the moment of making something is that moment of thinking imagining and making something but then it really has no control over yourself no i mean it can even catch even a painting can catch fungus it's not necessarily just these um, mustard seed ones and things like that so yeah i don't think you know, so time does play an important role also in that particular work that where i shot the uh, sky from uh, me and my friend shot the sky from bombay and calcutta one was trying to situate that dialogue of of time in that sense where you are thinking you have something but you may not necessarily have it or know it exactly you might know that this is precisely the time you know but need not be um i think references to a couple of works like that uh but with the escalator one yes it i think it i think the conversation was about how um these really sterile antiseptic spaces uh, like the malls or even a airport space how they kind of have almost a non space like feeling that you don't know what kind of time zone you are in probably uh you have no kind of relationship with the outside and it's almost like a capsuled space uh within and uh, i think the escalator works try to kind of um speak in that direction um also this whole thing of descending and ascending of the escalator of going somewhere where are you going uh, i think are the questions that uh I was hoping that this work could kind of speak of um but yeah I mean I think in that sense there's always a resistance as an artist of saying that no you're not going to paint on on an oil canvas because it's going to last for 100 years no I'm not going to do that uh, you'd probably make a work which is just probably uh, absolutely momentary in that sense that you're just supposed to view it at that moment and then it disappears and um, and i think these are just devices i mean i don't think uh, they like because it's done in art history and things like that these are just devices in a way where you want to speak of the immediacy of something as well you have a moment you have a space you have something that you want to attend to at that moment then to kind of uh, think of the preciousness of that thing um i think i'm interested in that i think i'm interested in the immediacy of something in 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 kind of pinning something down at that moment and not burdening myself with the preciousness and the life of the art object because yeah i don't kind of believe in that uh-huh. thanks uh, prajita uh, my name is shreya um actually just a couple of thoughts um, while i was uh, um, you know seeing your work um, one particular um, idea that uh, help us i know is a theorist from um, early 1920s um, proposes that the room is an index of organization in in the sense and i think in that sense your work of uh, your work basically you know shows us indices in that sense of the urban condition in in a way that we inhabit no like i mean uh, it's it's i think i mean, i was wondering if it is if it was possible for you to come up with the same portfolio uh, if we use this very stupid term if you were based let's say in delhi mm. you know like i mean probably not no i mean yeah. and the, you know the kind no, of absolutely yeah and then the, those indices would be something else yeah. in that sense yeah. and i think it's interesting to see uh, uh, in, in the work that way mm. second um, uh, I, th- i mean what is also fascinating is the fact that in almost every work there is a sense of suspension mm-hmm. and you want to believe that it's a cauliflower mm. you know or a egg or tomato but somewhere you don't i mean you can't believe it at the yeah. same time no i think 
in that even for the the gas eyes, yeah. no, that yeah. be kind of uh, staring at you yeah. in some sense. Uh, you, you you know that it's a yeah. stupid stove in some yeah. sense, but yeah. you don't want to believe that. And yeah. the suspension of that yeah. just to sorry, just to add to Japan's um, um, yeah. um, idea. Yeah. Uh, what what is interesting is that in that suspension, one also kind of you know relieves. Um, or rather kind of suspends all meanings, all uh, references, all um, uh, scales, dimensions, as we understand or kind of, you know, have become um, habituated to. And I think that probably becomes the, for me, the most interesting part about it, that kind of, it, uh, it liberates uh, this and makes it a work of art in, in that sense and makes it think in that suspension mm -hmm. and, and you know of course like we, we constantly ask uh, where do you locate a, you know, a work of art what do you call a work of art I think and one of this, the constant answers that you get is as long as it is able to push you to mm -hmm. think mm -hmm. You know, uh, something yeah. else than what you are yeah, used to. Sense. And I think it, it, in, in that sense, it's a very, very powerful, uh, you know, work of, uh, you know, a body of work which basically, uh, by the, just the simple act of suspension of, uh, really you know, it's, it's kind of really pushes you to think about so many other things. I mean, yeah. even if you would have not spoken about toxicity, the toxicity yeah. comes out yeah. of it. Yeah. It's kind of a, a washing machine zaz banal as this. Also, it, 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 I was just thinking the work of Absalom, yeah. uh, this. Yeah, yeah. and if Absalom was to be uh, here today, I think probably his work would be wow. of this, you know, yeah. uh, wow. in that sense of it, like this, an act of yeah. everyday routines. Yeah. No? It's yeah. like that would be. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, beautifully said, but I think, yeah, I mean, I think one wants to be in that state of easiness, I think, ease, you know, if you're at, um, if you're toiling too much in something, it just becomes more and more uh, uh, plastic or difficult to, um, or porous, uh, I mean, it's not porous enough for people to enter through. So that also in terms of the space, I think there's one thing that one miss saying uh, or I'm missing was uh, this, uh, yeah, I often wonder what it would be if I was living in Delhi or somewhere else. And I think the work is about situated with these walls in so much, uh, so strongly also because I grew up watching a lot of Marathi theater. And uh, I, would, I would have, you know, I've seen like Pekats Pala and things like that with my grandparents and um, and it would really bother me. The problem with Marathi theatre was that, you know, you have the stage in front of you, you have the proscenium and everything is so illustrated. You have the khidki painted with the cheaply painted landscape with the, uh, you know, the, the domesticity of where, you know, all these narratives were uh, situated within these domestic spaces so you have the frame painting uh, painted on the wall you have um, and it was all happening because of two things well, of course financially you know Marathi theatre was not as sophisticated probably as and also aesthetic I mean the, the need to illustrate everything the need to suggest everything ki your window I couldn't imagine that it could have just been maybe a you know a, just a sound of the bird or the fairy saying that it is the outside you don't need to like really draw the window and draw the door and then show that really funny perspective of the other building in front of that house so I would so I think I was really uh, I think this, this thing of the walls and, and the middle class and the narrative also has this other kind of um, I mean, today when I look back, I feel it's also the reason where, because one grew up seeing so much of uh, this really cheap production. <laughs> I just want to come back to what uh, Rupali had said. That yeah. You did say that you are not a political person, but you know, every work <laughs> is coming through and uh, uh, yeah. I think it's, it's... And yet, as you said, it is not literal. Yeah, yeah. So, Really appreciate that. Hey, thank you. Mm -hmm.
so it turns out that uh, today is women's day yeah <laughs> and uh, it's so interesting to be talking about domesticity and yeah. every day and, yeah. and uh, i am uh, very pleasantly reminded of uh, beatrice colomina oh yeah and uh, she talks of domesticity at war yeah and what better than this presentation to kind of uh, think about all the issues that have been raised nice. and also this uh, i'm sure you have seen the photograph of the atom bomb yeah. explosion yeah. of the hiroshima Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's your cauliflower reminds yeah, of, yeah, yeah. and uh, the washing machines, which were a direct der- derivative of the yeah. machines that were used in the war. Yeah, yeah. And uh, coming again back to the idea of uh, this idea of uh, uh, volatility yeah. uh, in domesticity, yeah. and uh, thereby kind of very subversively making a statement on the Women's Day. Thank you. So. Uh, I think it's a great presentation to have today, and it kind of auto curated itself. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, Prajakta. It was a lovely uh, presentation. Lots of thoughts to think about, and uh, thank you so much once thank again. Thank you. For thanks time. for staying back. Yeah, I mean, thanks for staying back. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you all. Uh, our uh, next uh, C conversation is going to be on 22nd March, uh, and uh, please stay tuned to our uh, website for the details of the event. Thanks.